Hi everyone, this is Max. Um, I'm here with a very early low production value preview of the manual rotation facility that I've built for the Q method R package. I want to apologize in advance for the sort of haphazard quality of this video. Um, I hope to post a better video uh, with better instructions later or maybe just some other form of documentation. There is lots of documentation um, coming for it anyway. This video is just for people who are interested in this uh, program. Maybe users have some feedback or can spot some bugs. Um, so there'll be more documentation coming. This is just if you're curious and uh, can't understandably be bothered with uh, installing uh, the program yourself. Okay, uh, you see here um, I'm using RStudio uh, as an IDE for uh, R. You can use any other one, it shouldn't be that different. I've cleaned up the interface a little bit so that it's not too messy. Um, now the logic how this how the rotation function, which we'll talk about in a second, works uh, in the Q method R package. I'll, I'll shall just uh, refer to that as Q method. Uh, anyway, um, so how this works is that we require uh, as an input a completed analysis already, a complete and full results objects from uh, Q method, the base function in here. Um, why do we want that? Um, it's mostly for consistency reasons. Um, I can talk some more about that if people are interested in that, but for now let's just uh, accept that that's the way it is. So first what we need is some kind of results objects. This is obviously not uh, that interesting. Uh, I'll just run Q method once here. Oops. Seems like I don't have Q method loaded, so that's a problem. Let's try that. This is obviously the kind of thing that should not happen in a well made instructional video. Okay. Here we go. Okay, now I need the results object, so let's make that using Q method. Uh, I have a data set here. It is helpfully called Q sorts. Uh, it's not the usual libset data, it's my own data. It's anonymized, so we're fine to use it. You can use any other data, of course, if you like. I'm going to extract three factors. Start with no rotation. Uh, it's important to note here that actually you can run the manual rotation on top of any uh, automatic rotation procedure. So it would not be any problem if I ran this with Varimax. That, that's no problem at all. I can just use any results object as a baseline so long as it is complete. Let's see, do we need any other options? No, the other are fine. So now we have here uh, a complete results object, right? This is the kind of results that you get from that. And now we use this one as an input to uh, the rotation function. Now the manual rotation functions in Q method are actually two functions. The one is an interactive one and this is called uh, q.mrot. All functions start with Q. mrot stands for manual rotation. And then we want the interactive one first. That's called choose. We'll talk more about uh, the implementation function called do later. So this requires, as I said, a results object. It also requires uh, a plot type because uh, we want to be able to see something during this interactive rotation. I'm going to start with base, which is uh, the simplest one. We'll make it more complicated later. And we'll start with uh, plot all equals false. I'll talk about more about that option in a second. And the other option uh, we don't need right now. Uh, there is one very important option I should talk about, and that's file. Um, as will be hopefully clear later on, you really, really, really need to store the results from this function in a sort of manual, hard-coded way. Um, you need to store the rotation matrix. So if at some later point you want to reproduce this manual rotation that I'm trying here, there is no way that you that this program can meaningfully store, well, first the user rotated x degrees left and right, and then this one, and then that one. So instead, what it uh, produces as an output is the 
complete rotation matrix and you really need to save that. Uh, and file just um, accepts any path and file name and it'll pass it on to uh, write.csv so it'll just write a comma separated value file. Uh, if you leave it blank, which I shall do here, the function will just output the rotation matrix to the console and you can copy paste it from there which should be fine too. But uh, again it's very important to save these results. There's no other way to actually implement it and um, also to reproduce it. Okay, but uh, more about that later. We should be set now. So I invoke the function. It starts with showing me this is pretty small. I'm aware of that. Um, but trust me those little blobs here, those are names. Um, in general, uh, I think that's probably true for this function in general, is you need a fairly big screen, uh, especially for the more complicated graphs later on, um, more complicated plots, I mean. Um, so this function always starts with giving you a plot of where you are at right now, right? So this is the current rotation, which you'll recall is actually none. So these are, uh, in fact, the loadings of the principal components because they're not rotated, they're principal components, they're not factors yet, uh, or not rotated principal components, I should say. Um, now, of course, this is a three-dimensional space, and that's kind of hard to wrap your head around. It uh, gets more complicated if you have more factors, so instead what this function, as any, I guess, interactive rotation function would have to do, is, is it looks only at the combinations of factors, right? So we have here, first, it's looking at a two-dimensional plot of factor one versus factor two. I'm saying factor, even though these are actually principal components, bear with me. Factor one versus factor three and factor two versus factor three. Those are actually all the combinations. Uh, the function does not give users an option to uh, sort of uh, flip the uh, axes around. That just makes things very complicated and confusing. So I hope that will be acceptable for users that the function just calculates the, com the possible combinations of factors and then plots the data accordingly. Um, you'll see here uh, in the um, console the same combinations f1, f2, f1, f3 and f2, f3 and the function is now asking us uh, which one I'd, we'd like to start rotating. Um, right? It says here you are in manual rotation based on a non-rotation. Okay, that's bad English. Uh, usually there's like a Verimax or something then it sounds a little better. Um, which factor pair would you like to rotate? And then gives you this table uh, which tells you, um, well, the combined factor names, F1, F2, and then it tells you which is on the horizontal and which is on the vertical. So, right, if we look at the plot here on the right-hand side, we do see that on the vertical axis there is, wait, F1, haha. <laughs> This is actually incorrect, so I have to fix that. Here is a bug. It should be the other way around. Uh, anyway, uh, in a future version where I have fixed this bug, um, this table will give you the factor that is on the horizontal, on the vertical of those plots here to give you an easier way to orient uh, yourself. So let's say I want to rotate uh, this one here first, the um, plot on the top left. Um, so that would be, well, it's still F1, F2, even though I've screwed up the labels here. So I'm entering now the row number, and you'll see here the row number, whoops, the row number for the combination of factors I'm looking for is number 1. Um, now it helpfully reminds me that I am, in fact, rotating factor pair F1 and F2, which is currently rotated at 0 degrees. Notice here again, it's 0 degrees vis-a-vis the uh, baseline results that you put into the function. So if there's already like a very max rotation in your data, then it'll still tell you that it's rotated zero degrees, even though it actually has been rotated. It's always vis-a-vis -vis the baseline function. I'm sorry, the baseline data. Um, okay, so now we can change an angle, uh, a change in angle to rotate. This is also important, it's a change in angle. Uh, a blank to complete or escape to abort. If you're just scared and want to get out of this function, you can always hit escape at any time uh, and nothing will be changed. So uh, let's try with one degrees. And what we see ideally happening is there's a little bit of a lag 
I'll later on use a different graphics device, which is faster. Uh, so the R Studio graphics device here on the right, it's very convenient because it's in the same window, but uh, it turns out that it's pretty slow for this kind of thing. So uh, PQ method by Peter Schmalk actually, actually definitely has a leg up on us here. It's a lot faster. Um, but if I speed this up a little bit, just entering one degree the time you see that you get this familiar maybe we can actually go by uh, bigger increments so it's really slow I'll, I'll use the different graphics device for more tests but you get the picture uh, this familiar rotation uh, and I think this is the way it should be I'm entering positive degrees uh, and that yields a counterclockwise rotation. I think that's the way it should be. Um, yeah, so you notice here, uh, I mentioned that a second ago, that you're entering a change in angle, right? So uh, it's it's meant for interactively rotating, so uh, it's doing the addition for you. Of course, I can also enter negative uh, degrees, and then it'll rotate the other way. Um, you'll notice that this is uh, also, well, we can try that if I uh, rotate it by 360 degrees, which of course makes no sense, then it actually simplifies that, uh, that input for you and tells you that actually 360 degrees from minus 2 is still minus 2 degrees. Um, so yeah, uh, that's the rotation. Now let's say uh, we're happy with the rotation. Um, obviously, I haven't gone into... Um, as I should, I guess, or as uh, users definitely should consider into sort of the substantive criteria that people might use uh, in this rotation procedure. This is just a technical video. Um, yeah, apologies for that. I, I think there are very good videos uh, on this on YouTube using PQ method, giving you a very good uh, visual impression of the kind of criteria that people might want to use. Okay. Um, so let's say we're done at this point. Uh, what you do then is you just leave it blank and hit enter. And this function is always very careful. It'll always ask you, do you really want to do that? Are you sure about that? And in this case, yes, um, we are. Let's say we are sure we finished with F1, F2. So enter yes or Y. Uh, and now we're back at the start. We see all of the currently rotated um, plots. So this will actually, this now includes the updated version of F1, F2. And as you know, F1, F3 and F2, F3, the other plots have also updated. Um, they have not rotated, but uh, they keep uh, the um, values keep changing around. We'll see that later on once we look at all of the plots at the same time. Um, so we could now move on to, let's say, the last factor pair, F2, F3, enter that row, uh, and continue rotating that as we wish. And again, it's excruciatingly slow, which is not great. So if anyone's interested in caching or otherwise improving the speed of this function, uh, you're more than welcome to join development. This is um, a little bit suboptimal still. And I'm embarrassed to say that PQ method, a program way older than this, is definitely a lot faster and more responsive. But we have our advantages too, I think. Okay, so let's say this is done. Uh, hit blank to complete. Yes, confirm that we are in fact done. Now, again, we're back uh, at the start and it's asking us which factor pair we'd like to rotate. And let's say we're done. We don't want to continue rotation. Now, um, I should mention here is that you can go back and forth between the different factor pairs uh, again and again. And this is often necessary in manual rotation because, you know, rota uh, rotating one factor pair actually sort of impacts another factor pair. Um, so that is, um, that is possible to do here. Uh, uh, for those interests, it is possible and completely unproblematic because, 
what the function does uh, uh, behind the curtains is it simply um, multiplies the old rotation matrix beginning with an identity matrix uh, with, uh, with whatever new rotation matrix uh, you uh, decided on when you were rotating any given factor pair. Um, so it's always sort of adding that on top of the old rotation matrix and the function as you interactively go is sort of uh, drags uh, an always updated rotation matrix along the ride. Okay, let's say uh, we're done with rotating all of the factors as I said, so I just hit, hit enter uh, for a blank input and again function is taking quite a lot of time. This might have something to do with my computer at this point too. The recording is probably slowing the machine down. And again, it's asking us, do we really want to finish manual rotation? Let's say yes, we do. Now, here comes something that I believe PQ method does not do at this point, but that I thought was very important, which is it asks you uh, to name the factors at this point. Because uh, if you do a manual rotation, obviously uh, this is the place, this is the decision where you substantively determine where you determine the substance of the factors, right? They, they change completely and all downstream results change completely depending on how you rotate the factors. You can always change the names later on and this is often necessary during a more intensive um, uh, abductive interpretation of the factor scores, etc. But um, I think it's a good idea, which is why it says recommended, it's a good idea to give a preliminary, however preliminary name at this point so that later on you know what kind of idea you had in mind uh, while you were doing this rotation, right? So you probably had some idea of what the dimensionality of say F1 versus F2 was and so this is now the place where you can store that. Uh, unfortunately um, I was rotating haphazardly so I really have no idea at this point but I'm going to give it uh, some names anyway. And um, this isn't the greatest interface for doing that. I think it'll, uh, I hope it'll work out for most people. What you simply do is you enter the names and you separate them by a comma. Uh, bar foo. Uh, notice if I enter only two names, but I need three, it keeps asking me the same thing. Um, so I really need to add three, uh, separate it by comma. I can use arbitrary number of spaces here, that's no problem, the function will uh, take out the white space, bar foo um, buzz, let's say, let's get a different letter, I can't think of a third word now, whack, and we have some kind of a bug, that's sad. Okay, the naming didn't work. I'll have to look at that in a second. What was going on there? Seem to have dropped out of the function. Um, I'll look at that later. Hopefully the function will be fine. But we can just continue and you look at a couple of different couple of different options here. The first one I want to draw your attention to is to plot all true. Um, the point here is that, as I know, said a couple of times, if you rotate one factor, you also end up changing the positions of the other factors. And that's a little inconvenient. Um, so what this function does is if you uh, tell it plot all equals true, it'll show you all of the factor pairs at any given time. And you can rotate them. Well, you can only rotate one pair at any given time, but it'll show you the effects on all the others. But I won't do this uh, in here. Let me bring up a different uh, different kind of graphics device before because this is not this is not fast enough so I'm whoops now taking a different graphics device uh, on OS 10 it seems that quartz is a lot faster than the built-in device in our studio I don't know whether that will be the same for other platforms. And we have a blank canvas here. Okay. Now let's try this function again with plot all equals true. And you see this is already a lot faster. 
Uh, let's again start with number one. Notice uh, with combination one, notice that because the function uh, sort of died on the last run, the results object has not been changed. But even if it had been successful, the last interactive uh, rotation, the results object would not have changed. Um, I'll talk more about how to actually change the results objects once we're done with the interactive function. Enter a change in angle to rotate. Okay, so now let's look at this. We're rotating this one here, right? Uh, F1, F2. I'm not sure you can actually see my mouse. And now let's try and rotate that in increments of uh, five degrees. Still not as fast as PQ method, but it'll get the job done. So you can see here that uh, the plot on the top left is rotating counterclockwise but if you look carefully at the other plots for example the one on the top right you'll notice that that plot is actually also changing well, like in up down kind of movement and we see in the top right corner the Q sorts. These are the people, right? Uh, I started moving up and down, and in the uh, bottom left corner where we have F2 and F3, there's this movement keeping rotating by five degrees. There's this movement uh, also up down. Yeah. Now this is kind of inevitable in manual rotation and it can make this a fairly challenging task, uh, which is why, of course, automatic rotation procedures uh, were developed, but they may not be appropriate for queues. So this is sort of the inevitable process that you have to go through uh, going back and forth and rotating things so that they make sense uh, in all of these plots assuming for now that you want to retain all of these factors. I know that some people uh, rotate more factors than they actually retain. Okay, let's say we're done here. Maybe we can give the whole saving thing another shot. Um, so let's say we're done. Yes. Finish. No, we don't want to rotate another factor pair. And again, confirm. Let's say we're won't give, um, obviously, this window is a little too small. Whoops. Let's say this time around we won't give any names, and then it's asking me do I really not want to give names? Yes, quite sure. Uh, and now we actually have the results. Now this is nice. Uh, what's not so nice is that we get this warning message. I'll talk about that in a second. Don't let that um, confuse you. You see here now that, first of all, we did not specify a file. So as I told you, the results are returned to the console. Uh, this stuff here that I highlighted, that might be the kind of thing that you want to copy uh, and paste either into a file yeah, probably into a file. It needs to be into a file, in, a, in some sort of file and save it there. Um, laid out more nicely, this is basically just a comma separated uh, file, right? You have these values uh, and they're separated by commas. Um, laid out more nicely, this is actually the same as this rotation matrix, which this function also sort of prints in a more nicely layout way to uh, the console on every run. And this is all that you need to restore uh, the results that we just had here in the plots, right? So if you want to implement this rotation procedure, this is the kind of data that you need to save and you then need to pass it on to um, Q method, uh, I'm sorry, to q.mrot.do, which uh, expects again the results objects, um, 
So let's say we now want to actually implement this rotation that we just did. Oh, before I continue, notice that this is actually still partly an identity matrix. I mean, it's not partly, it can be partly an identity matrix, but you can see that uh, actually only one pair was rotated because the other, uh, there are still some cells that are still zero, zeros, and ones. Um, so this would look more complicated if you had rotated more pairs. But I rotated only one pair. So let's say we now want to implement this. Um, and this will be a little bit of a hack job because I did not. Well, let's do that the next time around once I've actually saved this to a file. So I'm two. Or maybe we can just do it like this. No, let's, let's do it once we've saved it to a file next time around. Um, because there are more plots that I want to show. Let's make this a little smaller and let's try the whole thing again. Now there is a, a simple one uh, that's called Q Loa plot, which is not all that different from the base plot, except that because it relies on ggplot, it's slower, but the names are a little larger. Uh, and if you have named and colored factors, which I don't have at this point, then you'll see those colors um, in here as uh, axis labels, but maybe that's not the biggest win. Now, there is one thing that uh, I thought would be nice to do in um, R that I don't think is easily possible in PQ method, and that is to look at what any given rotation means in terms of all of the downstream analysis that is being done. Um, right, because at the end of the day, you are analyzing a factor, well, maybe in part on how the Q sorts uh, load, uh, especially if, as happens to be the case for me here, I know a bunch of things about these people who filled in these Q sorts. Uh, but in other cases, and this is uh, partly the case here too, you will mostly rely on the factor scores. Uh, of course, those aren't easily visible at this point. Uh, so it'd be nice if we could look at them, if we could at any point during the rotation see what any given angle means in substantive terms of the Q scores. Uh, I'm sorry, of the factor scores. Um, and the interactive function makes this uh, easily possible. It actually does run the entire Q method function uh, behind the curtains all the time. Uh, and if you ask it to give you uh, the plot type q.rotplot, and I've simplified this a little here by adding plot all equals false, it will actually do that. Let's see. This is taking now a, quite a lot of time, especially for the first time. Um, Here we go. This is currently not something that can be done incredibly fast. Okay, now uh, this is actually the variant that gives you all of the plots uh, at once. Um, and you can also enable that uh, during every single rotation by adding plot all equals true. I think I now said uh, plot all equals false. So once I decide on any given factor pair, it will actually uh, only show me the scores for that. So let's look at this. Uh, what do we have here? We have here, up here in the first row, the familiar, uh, and I should say whether these are rows and columns, this changes depending on how many factors you retain, right? If you have, I don't know, seven factors, then, well, you need a really big screen to make sense of this. Um, because all of the plots will be added and the combinatorics will make that, well, quite challenging. To be honest, I'm not sure how meaningful uh, this kind of plot is if you have that many factors, um, but uh, you can always choose simpler ones to that effect. Anyway, what was I going to say? You have here the familiar LOA plots, just the loadings, uh, and if you look really closely, you can see that they are actually colored according to uh, the factor colors. Those factors are automatically colored just so to make it easier to orient yourself. So this red stuff here, it's also uh, comes back here in the axis labels. 
Um, now below here we have the factor scores. This is the function uh, q.scoreplot that's working behind the scenes here. And um, what it does is, well, I, I talk more about this function, uh, I guess, in a separate documentation, but it essentially gives you the ideal typical Q sort that you would expect. Um, let me make this even, that you would expect uh, given Um, the currently rotated loadings. Um, let's see whether the graphics refresh. This looks a little better. Um, there's a bunch more information here that you can look up in the documentation for Q dot uh, score plot. For example, the, you'll see that the opacity of these red boxes here is different. That's the standard deviation of those items on those factor. Wait, on those loadings weighted factors. Hope I'm getting that correctly. Um, you can also add the QDC as little lines here, but I, I defaulted that uh, sort of away because I think that really is overkill. Um, yeah, you can change the font size a little bit. Um, I can sort of, I know my items, so I can sort of make out what they mean, even though there's some overplotting. You can change that to make the font even smaller so there's no overplotting. Um, there's some tricks that you can do in R2 and the graphics device changing the, the resolution at dots per inch is a is another good hack to make this more uh, easily readable. Um, yeah, so the idea is now that if you rotate this, all of those plots here will update. I haven't talked about this last one here. This is, um, I forgot how the function, how I call this function. Uh, this is uh, sort of part of a plot that um, Stephen Brown has in his uh, 1980 book. I, I'm not sure I've seen that anywhere else. Um, it basically just gives you uh, the loadings uh, for each of the participants, how much they load on those different factors. So you can see here that this one here, the first Q sort, Ursula, she's really mostly in the red and then there's a little bit of blue in her loadings and very, very little green compared to Susanna, who is all the way red and, well, less red actually, and then there's just a tiny speck of blue and uh, a lot of green. Again, for this um, plot, you should look at the uh, uh, respective documentation for more information on how that's computed. I plan to add a third one, uh, fourth one, different plot here, and that's the um, factor correlation matrix, right? Because you Ideal, maybe depending on uh, where you're coming from, you don't want factor scores, factors that are very highly correlated once they're rotated. So I plan on adding the plot here, but there are some um, methodological difficulties to do that that I think someone raised recently on the queue list. Um, but yeah, those are the plots for now. Um, now I should say that this will there's two more things to say. Like the simplest one first, you'll notice here that this one actually has some bumps, even though this was a force distribution, this one does not adhere to the force distribution. That's not a bug, that's something that can happen because of rounding artifacts. It is possible that uh, the factor scores do not, I'm, I'm guessing that this is also, also happens with other software, I'm not sure how other software uh, sort of square, squares this particular circle, but it is possible that uh, some this happens quite rarely for some reason it happens more often in manual rotation um, it is possible that it is impossible to rank order the weighted etc factor scores so that they adhere to the uh, force distribution and then we're just allowing some bumps here uh, you can read up more on that on the github uh, repository there's a bunch of issues around this where we um, spend some time figuring this out yeah that's one thing. The other thing, and this is sort of more consequential and may ruffle some people's uh, feathers. That's a, a weird way to use that expression. Um, which is that um, as this function invokes uh, the entire Q method shebang behind the curtains, it also relies on the automatic weighting and automatic flagging. Uh, that come with Q method. And I know that a lot of people uh, don't appreciate that so much and use uh, manual flagging instead. Now there is no way to do that here. So 
to the extent that your manual flagging will later on differ from this automatic flagging that's being done here, um, your results will change. The factor scores will not look like they look here. They are of course affected by manual flagging that might happen uh, later. I haven't compared this myself, how big a difference it makes. I guess it depends on how you flag. Um, but uh, I would hope that even if you plan to do manual flagging downstream, these factor scores can still give you sort of a rough indication um, uh, of, of where the, any particular factor uh, is going. Okay, I think this is, so recording thing is really taking a toll. I should add here, I'm also planning on adding options uh, that disable flagging and uh, waiting altogether. I have some doubts about those and maybe especially in this kind of uh, iteratively run Q method extraction, it might make sense not to have any flagging or waiting to begin with, but just look at, or I, I guess one of the methods will be just to look at the uh, regression type factor scores here and no extra Q method stuff. But those will be options and they're not even ready yet. Okay, so now let's see how this uh, looks. It becomes a little more simpler once we decide on a row number. And let's let's start with row number one. I promise this is usually not taking this long. Um, guessing this is because of the recording that's happening in the background. So we now see this is a little a little easier to look at, right? Now it's only four plots. We're now rotating factor pair F1 and F2. And notice how here, uh, and I laid that out with purpose this way, to the left of this axis here, you actually have the factor score, uh, the ideal, uh, idealized factor scores for that factor. And to the bottom of F1, to the horizontal axis, you have the factor that is uh, being rotated here. And again, here is the, is the other plot that gives you the loading per person. So if we now uh, rotate by five degrees, it is again taking an excruciatingly long amount of time. And here we see all of the plots updated. Um, you might notice that the colors just changed. This is um, because of a function within, I don't know, I think QF names. Uh, a QF color which automatically colors factors and uh, this function automatically takes a different color scheme once you have manual, once you have manually rotated factors which is what just happened here. We started with an automatic. The first thing we looked at where well, we still had some reddish hues, uh, we started with a non-rotation and now it's a manual rotation so the color scheme changed. The idea there is not so much to disorient people but to remind them that now that we're doing manual rotation, we're really looking at very, very different results and this function uh, behind the curtains tries to uh, reflect that with different color schemes. Okay, um, let's say we're done here. Yes, again, this was, would obviously be uh, quite the exercise to to do this in a sort of comprehensive way, um, especially if the plotting takes so long. I should notice here for people who are interested at a technical level is this is using the GG plot graphics package behind uh, the curtains and that's what seems to be taking so long. It's not actually calculating the Q method analysis that's almost instantaneous but uh, training all of the stuff for these plots is taking a lot of time and uh, the graphics um, packages that are used here are not meant for interactive use. Um, again, there's more issues on that and some thoughts on how to develop this uh, in the future using like uh, graphics, some sort of uh, graphics stack that actually can do this in real time, but that will require, I think, a fair amount of work and take us outside of R. Um, uh, We'll probably need to interface with some other graphics program. Um, okay, so let's try maybe the second uh, row. This should get us to F1 and F3. 
should have done this before I talked about how we can make this faster in the future. And here we go. See again the colors. It's the same color scheme, but the colors are uh, according to the factors that we're rotating. We rotate, we opted for row 2, that's F1 and F3. And you see here on the top F3, also here is the score plot for F3. And here you see the bumps that I talked about earlier. And F1 is down here, um, which is the other factor that we're rotating. And now let's give this a, I don't know, we can try uh, maybe rotating this 100 degrees to make sense of the scores. Notice that uh, here simple tax uh, as an item is on the very left and not saving enough is on the very right. So if we rotate this by 180 degrees, uh, this should change quite dramatically. And we're waiting. If you're curious about those items, those are from my dissertation project. And um, we see what we would expect, which is that actually, if you rotate by 100 degrees, the idealized factor scores, they invert themselves. I don't know, is that the right word? They switch around. Simple tax is now at plus 7, and not saving enough is at minus 7. Let's again go back so these people now, re this factor really likes simple taxes now and dislikes not saving enough. Let's go back 180 degrees. Now of course it would be nicer if this happened in real time and you could see the car is actually moving around, but that's a ways off. Um, see and now we're back to square one and the factor score up here is uh, the way it used to be. So. I think, uh, I found this immensely helpful during my manual rotation, and I think this is something that you can, I mean, it's it's a lot of information, uh, and so maybe you actually need this time that the computer takes to um, plot the rotated data, um, but it's helpful data. You can, uh, maybe in a way that otherwise isn't so easily possible, you can make sense of what exactly this rotation means, other than, you know, that Qsoid Susanna is up here and Helga's down here by looking at what, how that would uh, filter down to uh, actual Q sorts later on. Okay, now let's give this another degree, uh, not so much because we're interested in the data, but just to have a little more complicated rotation. Um, if you're interested in these items there from my dissertation, um, which is uh, on the Civicon Citizen Conferences. I'll also talk about that at the upcoming Ancona Conference. Find out more about it at maxhelp.de. These are items about uh, economics and taxation. Notice here how this bumpiness can get even weirder. That's rare, I've never seen that. But uh, the functions and the plotting is, is should be programmed such that um, it can pretty much take all of the bumpiness Okay, now let's say we're done at this point. Yes, we're finished with manual rotation. This is taking so long because it's refreshing the plots. Uh, see, now we're back to the plot all, which uh, I think is helpful at this point because it, before people are asked whether they're really, really, really done, um, they should see the final result, right? So let's say, yes, we're really done. We enter blank to complete. And I think just because it's so much fun, it's going to calculate the final result again. Yes, that seems redundant. Okay. And now let's say, yes, we can look at these results at the very end, whether we really, you know, that's what we were planning to do, whether those factors seem to make sense to us now. And then we enter Y, yes. Now let's try this whole renaming thing again. I'm actually, again, have no clever idea how to call those. Uh, them Lerum, Larum, Luffle. 
that's German. And now if we're lucky, it should actually refresh the plots with those new names. Yes! I love it when a plan works. So now that people have entered names, and notice again the interface here isn't perfect, you have to basically just enter them in the order given, and people can check whether they the factors were actually named correctly, again using those kind of substantive results that we have here. And if they were uh, named uh, correctly, let's say that they were named incorrectly, um, then no names are returned. Ah, there's a bug here. Um, so it should actually have asked me to rename them again. It did not. Lots of bugs to fix. And now we see here that uh, also the uh, resulting rotation matrix um, is returned with names. Um, and again, we have here the warning message to um, put this into, um, to use this as an input to qmrot.choose to actually get the results. And, and we'll finally do that now. Um, and to that extent, let's run the function again, but let's do this quickly now, only with the base plots. And let us specify a file where this should be saved. I think that's um, the best way to do this is to save the results to a file. Um, manual rotation video dot CSV, that's the name, and it'll save this file in the working directory. Um, so I'm currently in, tells you up here in GitHub forward slash Schumpermas, that, that'll depend on where you run your R, R session, but it'll, it'll always start from the working directory. For more details, you, you should go to uh, the function that this is calling, which is write.csv, uh, and also look at the, just look at the manual. Okay, now quickly some rotation. This at five degrees, done. Yes, and let's make this one. Rotate it by 50 degrees. And we're done. Done. Yes, really done. Um, let's call them Bach, Mozart, Haydn. That's some snobby names right there. And for some reason that seems to cause a bug. So let's try it without names again. I'm just rotating completely meaningless here. I don't think I should do that, but just to show you how this works on a technical level. Line complete, yes. Yes. Okay. Now we have done a rotation. It again prints the rotation matrix right here to the console. And you'll notice now that I rotated two pairs, so this is no longer an identity matrix, not even partly. Um, there are no, well, actually, there is still one zero here because there is one pair I did not rotate. Um, but it's more complex. Uh, I don't recommend copy pasting the printed version that you see here, first of all, because it uh, takes away some of the digits. And also it's just a hassle to get this into a form where R can accept it. Instead, the better way to do this is to save the file. And let's look at that file just for a second. Oh, let me go. Where is the saved? How this looks. It uh, seems intimidating, but it's really quite easy. So this is now the CSV, and let me show you the preview of that. It's just a uh, comma-separated file here rendered. Um, and you see those values with a lot of digits in there that you need to restore uh, the results. Uh, let's open this up just in a text edit app 
uh, to see what's in here. See, it's this is quite slow, quite small. Let's make this a little bigger. Um, very simple stuff, just commas and values and some, well, non-names here. Okay, that's that. Um, now let's do, that's the last thing that we're going to do, actually implement this, right? Notice that even um, when before we had all of the results on the right here, those were never actually saved. Um, the interactive function just runs um, Q method sort of on the fly again and again and again, but it never returns or saves that. That's for a reason because um, I think it really, really makes sense. <laughs> Sorry. Again, low production values. It really makes sense um, to save this rotation matrix and have it in a file somewhere and then to sort of expressly apply that rotation matrix that you just arrived at um, and um, yeah, then to apply it to some previous results object that you also used here. And then it'll return a results object. So how does this work? Um, we'll create a new object that we call results.rot. And we do, um, so this will be a results object very much like the original objects, right? All of the uh, results will be in there, the QDC, the loadings, the scores, etc. Because all of them, of course, have to be recalculated once the loadings change. And the loadings change if you have a manual rotation. So this now takes, we're using this uh, the non-interactive function, uh, which can also incidentally be run just from a script, right? So if you want some kind of reproducible research, a good way to do this is to run it as a script and to never run the interactive function uh, in you know a script. Of course, that, that makes no sense to have that run in a script. It won't even let you do that. But um, to proceed like this, to uh, at some point sit down and arrive at this rotation matrix that makes sense for you, and then in your script uh, or uh, RMD or RND, whatever document, you can just um, call this function here, which is non-interactive, uh, it expects results. Those are the old results. Now you have to make sure here, that's the one thing this function cannot test. It tests a lot of things for consistency, but it can't test that you actually supply the same object that you um, supplied to your interactive rotation. That you have to take care of yourself. Uh, you notice that before when I called the interactive rotation, I did use this object results. I'm using this again, so I should be fine. Um, now comes the rotation matrix. And I now need a read, uh, need to use the function. Actually, let's do this completely. Let's read in the results first, read.csv take the entire thing, the file here. This is one of the nice things about RStudio. Manual rotation, video.csv, it autocompletes. Yes, and then uh, header is true, I think. Let's see whether this gives us what we want. Sort of. So let's call this rotmap video. Now we, we of course we have to read this file again into R as an R object, right? Uh, and we're going to do this step by step. So let's read this in rotmap video. Um, well, first of all, it should be it should be a matrix, right? You'll notice from the documentation of Q dot mrot.do that it requires a matrix, not a data frame. Oops. And then there's also this completely meaningless x row video. Uh, let's get rid of the first one there. And here we go. Um, just to be clear, 
should probably get rid of the names here because those are not meaningful. I think the function, uh, sorry, the names were done. Okay, now this is the kind of object that we want, right? And again, notice uh, this was a complicated way. There's probably an easy way to read this in if I had used uh, appropriate options. This is just a complicated way of, again, reading into R as an object this file that we had just uh, looked, that we just looked at. Let's, let's bring it up again quickly. Um, this file here, the manual rotation.video.csv, and if you compare the numbers, well, you probably can't see that, but those, they're the same, it's the same object. We basically just read in an object from file which we had just written to file. Um, why would you do that? That seems weird, right? You have to do it because, well, you can also copy paste it and save it in some other way, but this is the most robust way. You have to do it because there is no other way to uh, systematically store what you did during the interactive rotation procedure, right? If you want to reproduce what happened during your interactive rotation procedure, you need this rotation matrix uh, because um, for technical reasons this is because uh, multiplication matrix multiplication does not commute, commutate? Anyway, the order matters for matrix um, multiplications. So um, it's, it would be very hard and completely, uh, well, it would make a lot of sense to store just how we rotate it in which order. So instead we have to save this rotation matrix. But now let's actually implement this. Let's say we spend a couple of days, a couple of hours, however long it takes to arrive at this great rotation matrix that makes a lot of uh, deductive, uh, I'm sorry, abductive or whatever kind of sense. Uh, and now we want to apply that to our results uh, objects and that again we do by writing a new results object. You can overwrite the old one if you like. Um, rot.results and q mrot.do is the function we need here and we start with results and we use rotmap.video as the rotation matrix and well, let's say we don't want it quietly, we want it loudly. So, here we go. It's still computing. The reason this takes time is, again, because this function, if you let it run uh, with quietly equals false, which is the default, it will, again, give you this wonderful, completely overwhelming plot on the right here to make sure, uh, and, and I hope that people will take the time to look at this again and again, to make sure that um, this is what they intended to do, right? that this is still the kind of rotation that makes sense to them. Uh, notice that you have a warning here that uh, the results objects were all renamed. This is a warning from QF names, no, from QMrod.do. Uh, and also you'll see what these names here are. They're pretty stupid. They're mrod dot f1, mrod dot f2. This is because, uh, as you can see up here, our original rotation matrix had no names. Um, but so that users know at any given time, if they're looking at some kind of uh, results object, that this has in fact been manually rotated, all of the factor names are appended by this mrod dot f1 stuff. Uh, now, uh, as I said earlier, it's recommended that at least some preliminary name is given uh, during at the end of the manual rotation interactive one, which is then saved to this file, which one read in can be uh, retained as column and row names. Um, and if there are column and row names uh, with meaningful names, then uh, that's actually the names that this function will apply to all of the results objects. So this would then be, say, I don't know, uh, aggressive or however you're uh, friendly or however your factors are called. Um, yeah, I think that's basically it. Uh, that took much longer than expected. I wonder whether anyone takes the time to go through this. Uh, maybe not. Um, I hope you find this helpful. We're very much uh, in need of feedback, bug reports, whatever you can find. 
um, you can report those at uh, Iora's um, GitHub repository where all of this is hosted.